Okay, so we should be good. So here we are at the fourth lecture, and this one I've called The Science of Man, Psychology, Economics, and Anthropology. And after this, uh, we really turn to two sessions that could be uh, termed the counter-enlightenment, actually, movements in the tradition that work against uh, enlightenment assumptions. But, but this will be an attempt today at looking at really the invention of social sciences by uh, various enlightenment figures. And I say in the first slide, that all these new ways of thinking about human beings individually and uh, in aggregate became the foundation for what we've come to think of as anthropology, psychology, and economics, also sociology, re really the, the, the whole ambit of, of social study. Uh, as we recognize them, they were born in this period. And there are multiple factors that contribute to this development. And the largest one, which I list first because I can't emphasize it enough, is the fact that the Enlightenment, the, the high period of the Enlightenment occurs at the same time that industrialization hits Western Europe, particularly in the United Kingdom, which is really the birthplace of the so-called Industrial Revolution. A famous economic historian, uh, W. W. Rostow, says that in 1760, or by 1760, the Industrial Revolution in England had reached a what he called the self-sustaining takeoff. It had so developed that it could feed off of itself without having really to create new technologies and new markets. So Britain, as the center of this industrial movement, is the perfect uh, laboratory for the development of social science. And that is because there's a spike in population growth, an enormous spike in population growth. And we'll look at the chart in a moment. That there is increased urbanization and migration. So populations are being displaced largely from the countryside into urban areas as two things occur. Uh, food production becomes much more efficient because of, of modern uh, farming techniques, fertilization, uh, field rotation, that sort of thing. Uh, people had been like Cook of Norfolk in England from early in the 18th century, or Jethro Tull, who the band, the rock band named themselves after, had uh, developed uh, scientific techniques for improving acre production of uh, farm crops. And with fewer people needed in the countryside, there's this displacement, people, excess population heads off to the cities at the same time that the cities are developing factory production and need the manpower. And, and hand in hand with this is increased technological development. And most people uh, usually think that increases in industrial efficiency follow technology, that industrialization is the product of technological development. It's actually something of the other way around. Uh, there are economic factors that, that goose industrial production, and that this usually forces people to start thinking about methods, uh, technologies for improving techniques to get more widgets off the assembly line. So you have the dislocation of traditional social groups and the creation as a result of, of new social classes. When people leave their farmsteads, people who lived in pre-industrial society were largely identified, not with a social class, but with their place. They were from a place. And they 
in pre-industrial society didn't know so much about what their opposite numbers were like in other places. But suddenly you get people from all these disparate groups gathering together in these new cities with lots of different accents there. And all of a sudden they see that they have something else in common. They've been displaced from their places and, and, and they are now being defined by their, by their labor. And literally it's the birth of what we've come to think of as the working class. If we look at the chart on the right, this is, uh, there are two Y axes, uh, the blue line for population uh, is designated on the left y-axis, and that's in uh, millions of pounds, or millions of population, excuse me. Uh, and the GDP, which is in millions of pounds, is, is the orange line at the right. And you could see that in the period from 1740 to 1760, 1770, there are dramatic increases on, in, in both population and GDP. Roughly speaking, because we have censuses to bear this out, the population of England doubles in the 18th century after remaining largely static between 1300 and 1700. And that's a, clearly a uh, due to things like the Black Death in the 14th century, but it's also due to the fact that uh, there weren't the sorts of significant uh, industrial developments that could support, or, or farm production developments that could support increased population until we get till 1700, and it really begins to take off in the 70s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And you can see by the 1790s, to 1800, the lines are threatening to go vertical. And they do in the early 19th century. They, populations of places like London go from half a million to two million in like no time flat. The other arena that spawns and supports the development of, a, of social science is the general scientific climate of opinion. The scientific developments of the 17th and early 18th century were really dug in at this point. And people presumed the methodologies of the new sciences. So we saw that in the late 17th century, all of a sudden the earth was no longer the center of the universe. The revealed God was displaced in certain circles by the idea of the clockmaker, the deist god. Nature could be explained by Newtonian mechanics. The social order was a product of a contract between humans. And science and reason resulted in change and progressive change at that. So the result of all of these uh, changes in the climate is that you come out the other side, humans are not special. They're not removed from the rest of the universe uh, by a special status that would permit them not to be studied the way other things get studied. They're not static. Humans evolve, societies change, and all of these topics, if you will, are there to be studied. People were within, humanity was within the mechanical universe and therefore subject to the laws of the mechanical universe. They could be studied. You could turn the tools of physics, you could turn the, the mathematical tools of, of large numbers and statistics and start examining people in groups and in classes, and for that matter, as individuals, as we shall see. Now, I'm going to focus our, our view of this through developments, particularly in Scotland, and 
because of the extraordinary social conditions in Scotland in the 18th century, it made it the perfect laboratory, the, as I say in this first line here, the ideal convergence of conditions for the development of the new social science. First of all, the first bullet, the highland clearance of the clans after the rebellion of Bonnie Prince Charlie in 1745, the remnant of the population of the United Kingdom that still wanted the Catholic kings of, of the Stuart dynasty that was displaced in 1690, that still wanted them back, was localized largely in uh, Scotland, where the Highland Scots, who were Roman Catholic, as opposed to the Lowland Scots, who were Presbyterian, uh, still had very strong ties to France and, and really fostered uh, the raising of armies to invade the South as recently, even though it was a doomed rebellion from the beginning, uh, but as recently as 1745. The result of this is that British armies were sent to the Highlands where they did two things. They mainly cleared great numbers of clansmen out of the Highlands. And so we get mass migrations to Ireland, uh, to England, and of course, to Canada, Nova Scotia, where even to this day, you know, Scottish games are still celebrated on a regular basis. But the other uh, weapon that the British used against Scotland was to make the clan leaders landlords to change property rules such that old feudal obligations were reduced to uh, rent ca and capitalist relationships in the highlands, which meant that the, the ties that clan leaders once had uh, to the clan's members were destroyed in time. And, and so the, the clan economy, if you will, was displaced all certainly by 1750. The dramatic social and economic convulsions that took place as a result of this and as a result of industrialization could be observed in a compact area, which gave Scotland a special status. <clears throat> Lowland agriculture and urban industry were at the doorsteps of Edinburgh and Glasgow. Scotland is a tiny place. And so Adam Smith sitting in his office at the university could basically look out the window and observe population movement, the development of, of, of new worker classes, the development, the building of factories, really cheek by jowl next to the university. Um, it was a new world. It was a small world. You could see each aspect of it close up. And intellectual life was rooted in the academic and professional classes who lived in cities, again, cheek by jowl, alongside laborers, merchants, and manufacturers. So everybody was in the same place, and the place was small. The culture was dominated by the new thought, the new enlightenment thought, the Presbyterian church, the kirk. Notwithstanding, there was no repressive alliance between church and state. Censorship was absolutely minimal, and, and this professional class of intellectuals who often were doctors or lawyers or university professors or the like uh, were there to document and comment and theorize on all the changes that were happening, literally where they lived. And with the notoriety of someone like David Hume, who was often reviled as an unbeliever in Scotland, and in which he was, and in Scotland and in England, Scots were fairly tolerant of radical thinking. So 
So the idea of, of taking arch positions on things was fine and dandy as far as they were concerned. And I just put three images at the bottom, a painting from the period of the Highland clearances, people just being thrown out of their homes, much like Ireland and the potato famines a hundred years later, textile mills are going up in Scotland. And by the way, textiles were always the first industry in the development of industrialization because there already was a consumer base. People had to buy clothes. Here's something you could make with greater efficiency for a market that was already there. So this isn't um, Apple 20 years ago inventing the smartphone and saying, ah, this thing is so neat, people will want to have it, even though there was no audience for a thing that didn't exist yet. This is quite the reverse. The audience was there, the consumer group was there. You didn't need Steve Jobs to invent a new taste. And of course, this is a period in which workhouses began to develop to, to solve the, the burgeoning social problems. You can imagine that the small town culture um, and rural culture of Western Europe had no social infrastructure to handle. I mean, there, there was no welfare system. There was no everything everything that developed as the harsh side of industrialization, everything that developed out of that or in response to that had to be invented anew, which was really uh, the work, not of the enlightenment, but of the early 19th century, which we've covered in another class, but there you go. So here we are in Scotland where everything seems to be happening up close even though it's happening all over the UK and in parts of France and certainly in Belgium and Holland all at the same time. Human nature, rationalism, and self-interest for Descartes, Hobbes, and Locke of the 17th century. The essence of human nature was rooted in the rational mind. Moral formation, ideas of ethics, and social bonding resulted for them from rational decision-making. That's why we got contract theory developing out of these guys in the 17th century. And, and that was based on a fairly simplistic theory of psychology that was based on this an, a theoretical idea uh, of how man ought to work given rational self-interest, a rational market. But those theories of psychology uh, that were lacking were the ones that were gonna be developed in the enlightenment, theories of how people actually made decisions, actually behaved, not how we theoretically needed them to behave to, to prop up our contract theory, not, not them behaving simply out of rational self-interest like, like brokers in a stock market. People, people respond in several non-rational ways. And, and, and this is what some of the Scots in the early and mid of 18th century were going to point out. Now, a sidebar to this, a theorist, something of a, I suppose you could call him a philosopher named uh, Bernard Mandeville, actually a Dutchman, but who lived in England and worked in England and wrote in English most of the time, made an extreme case for rational self-interest in this short work of his from 1714, called The Fable of the Bees, or in, a, in an even more famous phrase, private vices, public benefits. 
And he creates this allegory, this fable of bees in the hive who abandon their vicious pursuit of private self-interest, running around trying to gather all the honey they can gather, for a life of selflessness, virtue. And once they do, the hive collapses. And the moral of the story is that the community of man, the same way, benefits only from each individual pursuing their own selfish goals. So it was a theory of the newly emerging bourgeois marketplace that said greed is good, that that people pursuing their private selfish goals is what is makes for a system that works to the benefit of everyone when taken in aggregate. So we have him adding his two cents to the theory of how societies work in 1714. Then this remarkable trio of, of Scottish intellectuals, all of whom uh, knew one another, the father of the group, so to speak, the eldest of the group is Francis Hutchison. And uh, one of his direct students is, is, is Adam Smith, but one of his indirect students is David Hume. And these three respond, and we're gonna look how they do it in a bit, to the psychological theories of rationalism uh, by arguing that rationalism ignored actual human motivation. It just ignored it. And what they propose, and the theory that with Hutchison is going to be called sentimentalism, and with Hume and Smith, uh, they, they preferred the use of the term sympathy, looked at observable, non-rational roots of human behavior. In the 18th century, theories of individual or group psychology came under the name or rubric of moral philosophy. This would include you know, morals and ethics as we think of in, in the modern sense, but also included the study of human activity, what we think of as anthropology, psychology, et cetera. That is social science. And so in this group of Scots who all or doing what they call moral philosophy. And Adam Smith's most famous book in the 18th century is not The Wealth of Nations, but his book called Moral Philosophy. So the first of them, born 1694. So he's a generation older than Hume and a generation and a half older than Adam Smith. Francis, Francis Hutchison, the never to be forgotten Hutchison, as Adam Smith calls him, a famously charismatic professor at the University of Glasgow and immensely influential. And he argued a theory of sentimentalism in a work entitled, and he, had, he wrote lots of things, but a work entitled An Inquiry into the Original of Our Ideas of Beauty and Virtue. And he counters the theories of rational self-interest as motive by positing inter what he called internal senses, senses beyond you know, sight, touch, hearing, et cetera, that control and motivate human behavior. And these include what he called his first one using the 18th century spelling, public sense. And he described it as our determination to be pleased with the happiness of others and to be uneasy at their misery. So uh, we see videos of what's going on in Ukraine and it makes us uneasy. And he says, this is, this is built in. This is a human response. This is this is a built-in sense. This is part of the hard wiring of our whole psyche. 
And he says, there's also a moral sense by which we perceive virtue or vice in ourselves or others. And this goes to all those arguments about children have, are sort of built, they're built in with senses of what is fair and not fair and that sort of thing. Another one called what he calls the sense of honor, which makes the approbation or gratitude of others for any good actions we have done the necessary occasion of pleasure. My, what a good boy you were. And we even talk to our dogs this way, don't we? And their dislike, condemnation, or resentment of injuries done by us, the occasion of that uneasy sensation called shame, even when we fear no further evil from them. The shame and blame culture of ancient Greece, for instance. Achilles fears he has been shamed by Agamemnon and in his anger decides to destroy him and the, and the Greek mission to, to Troy. And a sense of dignity or decency, which is his fifth of these others. Group them together, call them sympathy. These senses generate pleasure and serve as motives for behavior. We act out of consideration of others' welfare and happiness, the public sense, or out of consideration of others' approval of our actions, the moral sense, and the sense of honor and dignity. In response to Hobbesian self-interest and fear of death, remember, Hobbes said, the only reason you agree to suspend all your rights and grant them to a sovereign is that the fear of your own death is the most compelling and overwhelming motive force there is. And therefore, we, we sign on to the social contract. And Hutchinson asks, how comes it then that we do not lose at the approach of death all concern for our families, friends, or country? Why is that not the case? If the imminence of our own death and the importance of our own death is, is the ruling motive in all cases. Now, this is going to be taken much further by Hume and, and, and to the furthest point with a slight difference by Smith. And I'm going to skip Hume here on, on this topic, at least, and, and go right uh, to, to Adam Smith. Now, Smith became the chair of moral philosophy at the University of Glasgow at the same time that he met, around the same period in which he met David Hume, and they became bosom buddies. They shared an admiration for Hutchison. They met for dinner like two nights a week. Um, they were in constant contact. And they very much agreed on his theory of sentimentalism. Now, both men developed the concept of what they refer to as sympathy, rooting motive in emotions. Smith's version was a significant departure for the future of psychological theory. His book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, was the foundation of his 18th century reputation. Now, on this topic, sympathy and subjectivity, Smith begins with a standard description of compassion. Then he's going to ask an interesting question, as we will see. But in this first bit, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Of this kind is pity or compassion, the emotion which we feel for the misery of others when we either see it or are made to conceive it in a very lively manner. That we often derive sorrow from the sorrow of others is a matter of fact too obvious to require any instances to prove it. For this sentiment, like all the other original passions of human nature, is by no means confined to the virtuous and humane, though they perhaps may feel it with the most exquisite sensibility. The greatest ruffian, the most hardened violator of the laws of society is not altogether without it. Everybody feels that thing. But he then raises 
the 17th century epistemological problem, the problem from the philosophy of knowledge and knowing. We don't have direct access to the consciousness of others. So how does this actually work? We don't exactly know what they're feeling. We don't have direct access. So how do I explain my compassion, my sense of pity, the pleasure I take or the displeasure I take and what happens to them since I don't have direct access to their consciousness? How are we to explain this? And he does it by offering a theory of what I call here. He doesn't, this is not his term. This is my term. Alter egoism. As if he's an alter ego, another, the, the ego of one in another. And it, the way he puts it, as we have no immediate experience of what other men feel, we can form no idea of the manner in which they are affected. But by conceiving what we ourselves should feel in the like situation, Though our brother is upon the rack, as long as we ourselves are at ease, our senses will never inform us of what he suffers. I'm sitting here in an easy chair. He's being tortured in the Lubyanka prison. They never did and never can carry us beyond our own person. It is by the imagination only that we can form any conception of what our his sensations. It's, an, it's through an act of imagination as if it were happening to us. It's our pain that we are imagining in an act of compassion. Whatever is the passion which arises from any object and the person principally concerned, an analogous emotion springs up at the thought of his situation in the breast of every attentive spectator. Pity and compassion are words appropriated to signify our fellow feeling with the sorrow of others. Sympathy, though its meaning was perhaps originally the same, may now, however, without much impropriety, be made use of to denote our fellow feeling with any passion whatsoever. It's a fellow feeling. It's a kind of alter egoism. And it derives from the imagination. In the tradition of Descartes and Locke, Smith recognizes the ultimate subjectivity of human consciousness. Sympathy, therefore, does not arise so much from the view of the passion as from that of the situation which excites it. We don't see their feeling. We see the situation and say analogously, that situation would cause me pain or pleasure or whatever. And that is what must be causing him or her pain or pleasure. We sometimes feel for another a passion of which he himself seems to be altogether incapable. Because when we put ourselves in his case, that passion arises in our breast from the imagination though it does not in his from the reality. And as an example, he said, we can feel bad for somebody who doesn't feel bad. We blush for the impudence and rudeness of another, though he himself appears to have no sense of the impropriety of his own behavior. We can blush for someone. As a teenager, didn't you blush at things that your mother said in front of friends of yours? Because we cannot help feeling with what confusion we ourselves should be covered had we behaved in so absurd a manner. And therein lies a, a foundation for the philosophical underpinnings of modern psychology, beginning to look at the relationship between uh, the emotions and the choices people make and the relationship between 
the conditions and the circumstances of life and the human responses to those schemas um, and situations in life. Now, what he, Smith is most known for, of course, is economic theory, which is what we're going to turn to here. And I've even uh, duplicated. And there we have from the, I believe this is from, I cannot see the, I believe it's from the 1776 edition of the Wealth of Nations. From our point of view, his most famous tract, he laid the foundation for classical free market theory and the discipline of economics. It was all there at his doorstep. He could observe. And so he comments on productivity when in his chapters on the division of labor and how uh, the division of labor makes the production of, of widgets so much more efficient. And he does this by examining his hypothetical pin factory where there are teams of different people making different aspects of the pin and finishes of the metal and the like. The division of labor However, so far as it can be introduced, occasions in every art a proportionable increase of the productive powers of labor. This great increase in the quantity of work, which in consequence of the division of labor, the same number of people are capable of performing, is owing to three different circumstances. First, to the increase of dexterity in every particular workman, everybody's doing now a narrower set of the same things, and you only put people to the task for which they are particularly suited. Secondly, to the savings of the time which is commonly lost and passing from one species of work to another, so you don't have to first, you know, smelt the metal before you go off to pouring it. To, to form a car fender and the like. And lastly, to the invention of a great number of machines which facilitate and abridge labor and enable one man to do the work of many. Now remember, this is going to be, it's 1776, this is going to be an idealization of the upside of manufacturing production. What we now think of as the smoky factories and alienated labor of a uh, impoverished and, and relatively despised workforce, these are problems that will arise out of these early developments, which economists and social reformers in the 19th century will spend their time addressing and houses of parliament and congresses and uh, political executives all over the Western world will take this as their primary test. Social uh, welfare institutions will develop uh, political parties based on um, worker self-identification like socialists uh, will arise all as a response to this. But this is the, the theory that produced the idea of special specialized labor being increasingly productive. And indeed it is. And it is to this day. Even though we would probably now define the issue is trying to balance productivity and social welfare all at the same time. Now, Smith also raised the specter of the famous invisible hand, that, that the product of all this was going to be a social good that was not intended consciously by any single element involved in the process of this more efficient production, but that the result of it all taken together is going to be beneficial. 
And he says, it is the great multiplication of the productions of all the different arts and consequence of the division of labor, which occasions in a well-governed society that universal opulence, which extends itself to the lowest ranks of the people. You generate great wealth, all boats will rise. Everybody, everybody will see an improvement in the material basis of their lives. Every workman has a great quantity of his own work to dispose of beyond what he himself has occasion for. And every other workman being exactly in the same situation, he is enabled to exchange a great quantity of his own goods for a great quantity or what comes to the same thing for the price of a great quantity of theirs. He can get money for it and be able to buy, choose what he wants from this new market. He supplies them abundantly with what they have occasion for, and they accommodate him as amply with what he has occasion for. And a general plenty diffuses itself through all the different ranks of the society. And every individual acting solely in per the pursuit of private gain is led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention, not the influence of Bernard Manville here. So he has taken his, his uh, social theories and his new market theories and, and seen a, a kind of a unification uh, for the enlightenment of and progress of the human race. Now, there were some, even back in the beginnings of industrialization, even though Malthus is not quite at the very beginning, he's, he's not born until 1766, but, but he began to notice that what everybody was then thinking of as this great new productive beast that has been let loose and in British society, this new industrial revolution, as it began to be called, was going to be fraught with problems. And he began to bring statistical analysis to bear. And, and from this moment on, uh, economics was always going to be reliant on uh, statistical analysis as a central tool. The young Math Malthus was well read in the literature of Enlightenment optimism and its view of a progressive rosy future. But in 1798, he published an essay on the principle of population, which painted a dour and dim picture of what statistics suggested the future might hold. And, and basically, in this moment was born the idea of economics as the so-called dismal science. Oh yeah, there will be progress, but it won't necessarily be for the good of everyone. And his argument was that population growth and subsistence really are out of sync. I think I may fairly make two postulates. First, that food is necessary to the existence of man. Second, that the passion between the sexes is necessary and will remain nearly in its present state. People are gonna keep on having babies and people are still gonna need a daily's ration of calories. By that law of our nature, which makes food necessary to the life of man, the effects of these two unequal powers must be kept equal. So as you produce people, you better be producing food. If you're going at the same ratio, if you're going to maintain a constant standard of living. But the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. Population, when unchecked, with nothing intervening, 
Population increases, as he puts it, in a geometrical ratio. Subsistence, in other words, producing the food for that population to subsist, increases only in an arithmetical ratio. If, if people start having four or five kids apiece, population's gonna double in, you know, whatever. But it's hard to expand food production, even though we had the green revolution in the 1970s and 1980s. A slight acquaintance with numbers will show the immensity of the first power in comparison of the second. The constant effort towards population increases the number of people before the means of subsistence are increased. So he says, so look at the way it actually happens. First, more people getting produced. And then the response to it is we better catch up and, and increase more food. We're not going to increase food production before that population expansion, because that would drive down the prices on the food and the farmers aren't gonna do that. They're only gonna produce for demand. The food therefore, which before supported 7 million, must now be divided among 7 million and a half or 8 million. The poor consequently must live much worse and many of them be reduced to severe distress. He said, so look at what happens. Before there is a response to the population growth, this imbalance is going to drive some number of people to the wall. The number of laborers also being above the proportion of the work in the market, the price of labor must tend towards a decrease. Wages go down. Well, the price of provisions would at the same time tend to rise. And he suggested that until social planning can figure out some way of maintaining a, a limit on the growth of, of the imbalance between population increase and subsistence increase, until that can happen, the only way it will be brought back into balance is by what he called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It's going to be famine and war and, and, and perhaps the modern world. Now, Malthus himself will be attacked. People will talk about, um, make more sophisticated arguments about the growth of new markets and new methods for producing um, agricultural crops and new ways of dealing with displaced labor and social welfare reform to help people during that period when the gap exists, et cetera. But that's the work of the 19th century for the most part on the part of both economists and reformers and political figures. Moving right along, this is also a period in which cultural relativism um, is vaunted. There are studies of, for the first time, of people in other non-European or colonial environments. Uh, religious systems are studied, social systems, uh, economic systems of people all over the world. High cultures, what they would have considered high cultures, or what they would have considered more primitive cultures, using the, the, the biases of Eurocentrism in the 18th century. But ethnography was a field that developed in the period. For two centuries, voyages of discovery and expansions of trade had brought Europeans into contact with other continents. The range of different social, religious, and cultural systems introduced the idea of cultural relativism to an audience already primed with questions about human nature. Aren't we the product of our cultures? If you took a kid from 
born into one society and plunk them down into the other, what's going to happen? They're going to become the product of the new society, are they not? To the enlightened mind, free of parochial cultural particularism, other cultures were evidence of the plasticity of human nature. And so what was human nature and what was the state of nature then becomes an open question, not just for people doing political philosophy, but for people doing psychology. I mean, you come upon a tribe of cannibals who have a very strong system of ethics and self-governance. And you have to ask the question, what is the nature of the taboo. And what is a willing, a human being willing to do under what circumstances with social approbation and agreement that they're acting consistent with, with, with the ethical and moral responsibilities of human life in that the group that they find themselves in. So all of a sudden, it's everybody back to the drawing board. Let's figure out what human nature is all about. And some images, 17th century image of a Native American. Um, this very interesting plate on coffee, tea, and chocolate uh, with someone from the Near East and someone from it. Far Asia and someone from North or South America, um, all of a sudden everybody's enjoying the fruits of these other societies. And here is a print, a 17th century print of the African Zenega people. I don't know where in Western Sub Saharan Africa they're from, but it makes it look like a very orderly, fairly developed society. And books abounding in images of cultural others were famous in this period. And we're gonna, I'm gonna look at one in particular in a moment. So cultural criticism of their own culture was often done by writing either novels or um, other kinds of fantasies done through the eyes of visitors to Europe from other cultures. The first famous one to do this was Montesquieu himself published The Persian Letters. It's a novel through letters of two Persian noblemen or in Paris in 1720, he uses the device of the cultural outsider to satirical ends. Uh, look at these crazy Frenchmen, look what they're doing. The following passage is a commentary on the aristocratic, then illegal aristocratic tradition of fighting duels. On this account, violence prevails amongst the French. For these laws of honor require a gentleman to avenge himself when he has been insulted. But on the other hand, justice punishes him unmercifully when he does so, the government comes after him. If one follows the laws of honor, one dies upon the scaffold. If one follows those of justice, one is banished forever from the society of men. This then is the barbarous alternative, either to die or to be unworthy to live. Aren't these Frenchmen crazy? How loony. And to make his point, it shows that here is a perfectly cultured, two cultured folks from Persia, and this is how it looks crazy to them, just the way things that they do might look crazy to us. Then in the 18th century, and it carries all the way well into the 19th century, there is this fashion that, that explodes for uh, what they call Orientalism, uh, particularly Turkish and Near Eastern uh, fashions and attitudes. And so you start getting people dressing up in what they thought of as Oriental costumes. Um, and 
these cultures, the the Ottoman Empire, for instance, on one hand was they were thought of as backward and repressive, but as at the same time they're perceived as more alluring, luxurious, sensual, and dangerous. So we have many operas in the period that are set in the Sultanate. And, and and many images of deep uh, voluptuous sexuality surrounding the harems of the, of the sultan and the aristocrats of, of, of the sultanate. So here we have uh, period paintings, Lady Howard and her fashionable outfit and Madame de Pompadour herself, a uh, lady, a very famous, uh, memoir is Lady Mary Wortley Montague, and we're, we're going to, the next slide will tell us about her, and Antoine de Fabre. Uh, and these were not just for costume parties. This was people who like to see themselves in these outfits. Now, continuing with the theme of Orientalism, between 1716 and 1718, Lady Mary would Accompanied her husband, the British ambassador, to the court of the Sultan. She's the wife. Her letters to friends were later published as the Turkish Embassy Letters. And this is a quote from her being given a tour of the Sultan's harem. And this is what she had to say I know no European court where the ladies would have behaved themselves in so polite a manner to such a stranger. I believe in the hall, there were 200 women, and yet none of those disdainful smiles or satiric whispers that never fail in our assemblies when anybody appears that is not dressed exactly in the fashion. They repeated over and over to me, Utzele pek Utzele, which is nothing but charming, very charming. The first sofas were covered with cushions and rich carpets on which sat behind them, but without any distinction of rank by their dress, all being in the state of nature, that is, in plain English, stark naked, without any beauty or defect concealed, yet there was not the least wanton smile or a modest gesture amongst them. So she, she's introduced to a harem of 200 um, naked women with their with their attendants uh, in back of them, uh, and here is an odalisk. This a, a painting by Ang called the Odalisk with Slave. Uh, many of these the slaves in the harem, of course, would would have been eunuchs, uh, and this painting was allegedly based on Lady Mary's letters, and Ang you know, clearly uh, intended all the uh, titillation that the voluptuous Otalisk offers uh, for his uh, newly hatched Victorian audience in 1839. And, but images of this elk were very common. So the other culture, the other was fascinating it often was titillating. Uh, it was considered civilized, but clearly following a different set of rules and a different set of assumptions than those of Western Europe. So scholarly commentaries in this period began to proliferate. And they weren't initially scientific, but they were more like memoirs of travels through the, the other society. It wasn't really until the early 19th century that the concept of distinct methodologies akin to the differing methodologies of the physical sciences developed. The idea of comparing societies was, however, consistent with the Enlightenment's interest in human nature and social progress. So somebody who contributed to this was the wonderful Scottish historian William Robertson, another one of these uh, guys who was both academic and a clergyman supported by the church. 
historian of Scotland and of the Americas. The following excerpts are taken from the History of America, published in 1777, Human Nature and Historical Progress. In order to complete the history of the human mind, and to attain to a perfect knowledge of its nature and operations, we must contemplate man and all those various situations where he has been placed. We must follow him in his progress to the different stages of society as he gradually advances from the infant state of civil life toward its maturity and decline. So theories began to proliferate that societies moved in stages and that when you look at different uh, communal groups in other parts of the world, what you were doing is seeing people adapting to their circumstances, but embodying a certain state that all societies probably had to go through at some point or another in their development. A human being, as he originally comes from the hand of nature, not the hand of God, it's the hand of nature, is everywhere the same. Universal human nature, everywhere the same. No racialism. At his first appearance in the state of infancy, whether it be among the rudest savages or in the most civilized nations, we can discern no quality which marks any distinction or superiority. The capacity of improvement seems to be the same, and the talents he may afterwards acquire, as well as the virtues he may be rendered capable of exercising, depend in a great measure upon the state of society in which he is placed. To this state, his mind naturally accommodates itself and from it receives discipline and culture. It is only by attending to this great principle that we can discover what is the character of man in every different period of his progress. Everywhere people are the same, but to the degree that they seem to be different, we are talking about a difference in their social systems the period of progress of their society, which is what we are now studying. They, as a group, all of a sudden, you remember Mrs. Thatcher's famous, there is no such thing as society. There are just people. Uh, There are just individuals. Well, here in the 18th century, theorists are beginning to say something else. There is such a thing as a society which molds the individual who adapts to its own internal logic. Continuing in the history of America, it is only by tradition or by digging up some rude instruments of our forefathers that we learn that mankind were originally unacquainted with the use of metals and endeavored to supply the want of them by employing flints, shells, bones, and other hard substances for the same purposes which metals serve among polished nations. So clearly, we be, the rudiments of archaeology are going to fall into place. Man was long acquainted with the other metals, gold, silver, and copper, before he acquired the art of fabricating iron or attained such ingenuity as to perfect an invention to which he is indebted for those instruments wherewith he subdues the earth, plows, and commands all of its inhabitants. Because until you invented the heavy plow, uh, you couldn't break ground deeper than six inches and thereby really improving farm production. A cautionary note about objectivity. It is extremely difficult to procure satisfying and authentic information concerning nations while they remain uncivilized. To discover their true character under this rude form and to select the features by which they are distinguished requires an observer possessed of no less of impartiality than discernment. Beware false equivalents. A tribe of savages on the banks of the Danube must nearly resemble one upon the plain washed by the Mississippi. Instead, then of presuming from the similarity 
that there is any affinity between them, that the, the Helvetii or the Swabi of ancient Germany are the same as the Mandans of the upper Mississippi would be a mistake. We should only conclude that the disposition and manners of men are formed by their situation and arise from the state of society in which they live. But there could be many other things that make them vary. The moment that begins to vary, the character of a people must change. So really a, a kind of advanced thinker on, on how to reculture and cultural artifacts. A peer of his, Adam Ferguson, the so-called father of modern sociology, argued for analyzing human nature through the group rather than through individual activity. The following are excerpts from an essay on the history of civil society from 1767. All of this being done either in Edinburgh or uh, Glasgow. Mankind is to be taken in groups as they have always subsisted. The history of the individual is but a detail of the sentiments and the thoughts he has entertained and the view of his species. And every experiment relative to the subject should be made with entire societies, not with single men. Nature, therefore, we shall presume having given to every animal its mode of existence, its dispositions and manner of life has dealt equally with the human race. And the natural historian who would collect the properties of the species may fill up every article now as well as he could have done in any former age. The attainments of the parent do not descend in the blood of his children, nor is the progress of man to be considered as a physical mutation of the species. Okay, there's no epigenetic evolution here. And on the state of nature. We speak of art as distinguished from nature, but art itself is natural to man. He is in some measure the artificer of his own frame, as well as of his fortune, and is destined from the first age of his being to invent and contrive. If we admit that man is susceptible of improvement and has in himself a principle of progression and a desire of perfection, it appears improper to say that he has quitted the state of nature. We are all always in our natural state. The, the 17th century fiction of the state of nature as this Garden of Eden in which everything got hammered out, he said, it's, it's a ridiculous construct. The latest efforts of human invention are but a continuation of certain devices which were practiced in the earliest ages of the world and in the rudest state of mankind. And then one final peak, this is my last slide actually, on the development in this period of educational theory and a um, Frenchman named Claude Helvetius, self 1715 to 1771, controversial figure whose essays on the mind was condemned by the state and the church for atheism. He apparently didn't know how to play the censors as well as Voltaire. He is best remembered for his progressive theories of human intelligence and the use of education to reform society. And here's a couple of excerpts from a treatise of man, his intellectual faculties and his education. The education necessarily different in different men is perhaps the cause of that inequality in understandings hereto attributed, hitherto attributed to the unequal perfection of their organs. It's actually differences in education that are at the root of inequality. Education is a social instrument. If I can demonstrate that man is in fact nothing more than the product of his education, I shall doubtless reveal an important truth to mankind. They will learn that they have in their own hands the instrument of their greatness and their facility. 
felicity, excuse me, and that to be happy and powerful, nothing more is required than to perfect the science of education. If this examination should not give the solution, we ought still to make it, or it will be useful as it will compel us to the study of ourselves. The study of ourselves and education as a continuous process. I still learn, this could be the, the motto for the mill program, I guess. Lifelong learning, there you go. I still learn. My instruction is not yet finished. When will it be? When I shall be no longer sensible at my death. The course of my life is properly nothing more than a long course of education. What is necessary that two individuals should receive precisely the same education? And that would be that they should be in precisely the same positions in the same circumstances. Now, such a hypothesis is impossible. It is therefore evident that no two persons can receive the same instruction. So this argument for individualism uh, as a result, excuse me, as a result of education. And uh, that is all I wish to cover on that topic. Um, any responses or comments or objections or I'm gonna unpin myself so you guys can all, you should all be able to see each other now. What sayest thou? A moment of great clarity, apparently. I just put myself in the chat and said it. Uh, Joe and I keep saying that our goal in life is to learn something new every day. There you go. We do. Yes. It's great. Great class. Thank you. Lou? Yeah. Um, so can we draw any conclusions about, you know, Frederick Douglass went to Scotland to, you know, speak about abolition and there, there seemed to be a lot of movement in, in Scotland um, and, and reception to the, to the idea of abolition. Did this era set the stage at all for that? I would say, I would say uh, it, was a com it would have been a combination for that, a combination of, of both enlightenment liberalism as was common progressive ideas being very common among the professional classes in Scotland, but the Scottish church, the high Presbyterian church also being uh, somewhat socially conscious in that period. At the same time, it was, it was probably all the forces were sort of lining up. It, not unlike, not unlike, you know, Boston in the period. Mm -hmm. You know, you would have gotten, all that abolitionist sentiment, both from liberal thinking and from all those congregationalist ministers who were enlightened about human nature and that sort of thing. Got it. Now, over the next two weeks, I mean, up, up until now, we've looked at the Enlightenment sensibility, the Enlightenment as a movement, these ideas that in the air of, of scientific progress extending to social progress, uh, and an assumption that of, of optimism about the future, um, a, a belief that the that the engine of the movement was the rational and scientific application of human effort on, on every problem uh, that humans face. And we're going to see in the last two sessions, and the first one, uh, 
a sensibility arise that said that wants to say, oh, this emphasis on rational progress, uh, you don't have quite right. Uh, it, it, it denies the overwhelming driving force of human emotion. And, and we'll see the expression of this in the so-called romantic movement and, and what holes it tries to poke in the, the classical ideal of the Enlightenment and, and in the last session, we're going to look at the French Revolution as a product of Enlightenment arguments to some degree, of Enlightenment arguments taken taken and applied extremely radically and a conservative reaction to it such that the modern traditions of radicalism and political conservatism all get born as an assertion and a revision of enlightenment ideas. So, so we'll see these two classes as, as, as somewhat uh, departures from enlightenment goals and, and, and commonly shared assumptions. But that's what we will be doing. So with no further comments, I'm going to call it a day and have a good week as we head into the fall. <laughs>